Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. I'm going to briefly look at verses 36 through 39, not in depth, because it's going to serve as a launching pad for chapter 11. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your grace and mercy. That Jesus is still the solution to the problem of sin. That there's hope and forgiveness. That there's grace and mercy and love. And Heavenly Father, we pray that as we draw together and as we open up our Bibles, we would also open up our hearts. Lord, we pray that we would come to consider what the Bible has to say about faith. And that, Lord, we would trust you. Knowing that people in the past who have trusted you <laughs> have experienced great confidence and great assurance. And so, Lord, again, we pray for the brokenhearted that you would mend that heart. For the empty hearted that you would fill them. For the guilty heart, Lord, that you would forgive them. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fill us up with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to be just looking at the first three verses. The writer says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. We're going to pitch our tents in Hebrews chapter 11 over the next few weeks. The chapter is rich. It begins with an explanation of faith in verses 1 through 3 and again in verse 6. Both the nature of faith in verse 1 and then the necessity of faith in verses 3 and again in verse 6. The writer of Hebrews will then appeal to the great examples of faith. Both who they were in verses 4 all the way to verse 32. What they did... In verses 4 through 33, what they endured, what they received, the chapter serves as an illustration of the lessons of chapter 10, verses 32 through 39, where we pick it up in verse 36, for you have need of endurance, hupomone. It means endurance under pressure, under trial, under difficulty, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So what is the promise? Jesus is coming back. And what else is the promise? Now the just shall live by faith. He quotes Habakkuk and the whole chapter 11 is devoted to the unfolding of that statement the just those who are justified that means those who can have a right relationship with God those who can stand before God washed cleansed are justified by faith the chapter serves as an illustration how God has been faithful in the past in verses 32 through 34. How God will continue his care and concern in verses 35 through, th through 39. The just shall live by faith, verse 38. The whole chapter, chapter 11, is de dedicated to, the, to unfolding the profound statement of those who are justified before God will live by faith. They will walk by faith. They will worship by faith. Some of them will want wind up wandering by faith in verses 8 through 10. Some will wait in faith in verses 11 and 12. But what all of them are doing, whether they're walking, whether they're worshiping, whether they're wandering, whether they're waiting, they're going to do it in triumph. They're going to overcome. There's no mention of the failures of the saints 
in Hebrews chapter 11. Not a single failure is listed. Why is that? I'm going to suggest to you that part of the answer is probably found in chapter 10, verse 17. If you just turn the page and look what it says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Imagine at a time, imagine a time when your faith is remembered and your failures are forgotten. Lord, do you remember? No, actually I don't. Hey, do you remember when I said that? Do you remember when I did that? Do you remember that huge failure, that gigantic mistake? And the Lord goes, no. Here's what I remember. That you loved me. That you trusted me. You see, that's an amazing, amazing thing. In these first three verses, the author is going to speak about the wisdom of faith in verses 1 and 2. And then the warrant of faith in verse 3. The author is going to give an explanation of faith in verses 1, 2, and 3. And then he's going to give examples of those faith of faith in verses 4 all the way to verse 32. There's a reason. There's a reason why this chapter has been called God's Great Hall of Fame or Great Hall of Faith. And the key to greatness with God is faith. This is the person who sees the Lord with the eyes of faith, believes God with the heart of faith, worships God with the mind of faith, and walks with God with the feet of faith. Our faith rests solidly on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Bible, he is the object of our faith and the author of our faith. No wonder the writer begins with a description of faith. And here in chapter 11, this is the only place in the Bible, the only place in the Bible where a description of faith is given. Oh, there's explanations and principles that are given throughout the scripture, but here we have an actual definition. Look what it says in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what is faith? According to the Bible, faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is not a substitute for an explanation. The word substance means assurance. And the word evidence means proof. The reason why I want that to soak in and sink in is the Bible is making it abundantly clear that faith is not imagination. Faith is not deceptive. This becomes so important for the person who wonders, I wonder if this is all in my imagination. I wonder if I'm being deceived by what the Bible says. I wonder if my experience with God and, and my trusting Jesus as my Savior is some gigantic illusion or deception. And nothing could be further from the truth. The, uh, the writer of Hebrews has used a form of the word substance earlier in chapter 1, verse 3, where he wrote, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image, same word, of his person. And in chapter 3, verse 14 of Hebrews, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, same word, Chapter 1, verse 3, the word is translated express image. Chapter 3, verse 14, it's translated confidence. Chapter 11, verse 1, it's translated substance. The word, by the way, in the Greek language is hypostasis. Some of you know about those two words. It's a prefix and a suffix. Hupo is intensive. 
it means, the word itself, hypostasis, means foundation. It's also translated in the Greek language, the title deed. When we think about something that has a foundation or we think about a title deed that is given, if you've ever purchased a piece of property and you were fortunate enough to live long enough to actually pay off your mortgage, they give you a title deed. They give you proof of possession. And the word, so it means foundation or deed or guarantee. And evidence is, a, is another interesting word, elegos. It, it means conviction. So then faith is more than belief. It goes beyond belief. It's an act of the mind and of the heart and of the will. Our mind and our heart believe something. And then our conviction is that this is true. The writer of Hebrews incorporates those terms. Assurance. Proof. Because so many people say, I want some assurance. I, I, I need some proof. The writer of Hebrews wants the reader to know that our faith is rooted and grounded in the most solid of the most possible solid conviction. John MacArthur writes, true faith is not based on empirical evidence, but on divine assurance. And it is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. The reason why I think this is important is because John has it right. It is true faith is, and I'm going to suggest to you with, with this. True faith doesn't mean that there is no absence of empirical evidence. But I'm going to suggest to you that it isn't so much the absence of empirical evidence as the reality that the most compelling evidence, the most com as compelling as the evidence for, for the Bible is, for the history of, of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as compelling as that is, the most compelling evidence that the writer of Hebrews is, is making is the assurance that God has given. Remember, the reoccurring testimony in the Bible is God tells the truth. Remember, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Is God capable of lying? The answer is no. So faith is not concerned with faith, but what faith trusts. In other words, faith is not a force, and your words are not the container of the force. Faith is not a magical property. It is not an invisible spiritual substance that you use to manipulate reality. Faith doesn't create reality. God is the maker of heaven and earth. God is the being who creates reality. And our confidence and assurance is in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we say that Jesus is the object of our faith. I remember hearing a very famous so-called Bible teacher who was on a television program. And, and the host asked him, well, what do you... Say to the, the pastor or the preacher who says that faith is not a force and, and that your words aren't the container of the force, but, but rather that Jesus is the object of our faith. And, and the guy had the temerity to say, what does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus is the object of our faith? I go, how could you be a complete idiot? How could you not understand something that is so simple? That faith is a confident assurance of who God is. And by the way, faith, well, in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, this is what it says. Testifying to Jews, this is Paul, and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ is faith's object, then the spirit is faith's power. Faith is not a force. 
Faith is confidence in God, in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, it says in Galatians chapter 5. So the verse itself is written in the style of Hebrew poetry in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The Hebrew people have a, a, a way of writing poetry that's called parallelism. And, and it's, that's the way the book of Psalms is written. The Hebrew poet would often use a parallel or a nearly identical phrase to state something. So when he says faith is the assurance that the thing that God says is true, that his word is true. Faith is the assurance that God will act according to what he has said in his word. So in the Bible's definition of faith, faith is believing in God, but it's way more than that. It's believing in God and then believing what God says. So now connect the dots. It is believing that there is a God, but it's more than that. It is believing that this God speaks. Remember at the very beginning of the book of Hebrews, in the opening verse of the opening chapter, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his own dear son. Think about it for a moment. God exists. God speaks. What does God have to say? And this is the key. What God has to say about human beings, about our human condition, about our human circumstance, is found collectively in this book called the Bible and in the ministry of Jesus, in the life and the teachings of Jesus, in, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So in the Bible's definition of faith, it's believing that God is, that God speaks. And then there's a third component. That what God says is true when he speaks. You see, I think most of us could collectively say, yeah, that makes sense. There's a God. If there's a God, he has the ability to communicate. If there is a God who has the ability to communicate, doesn't it make sense to you that he would have something to say? And what does he have to say? The reoccurring testimony of the scriptures is, this is what he has to say. I love you. I made you. You're in big trouble. I made you and I love you. And I'm going to rescue you. Williams translates this verse. Now faith is the assurance of the things we hope for. The proof of the reality of the things we cannot see. William Barclay translates this. Faith means that we are certain of the things we hope for. Convinced of the things we do not see. Dr. J. Oswald Sanders says, quote, Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. How do you know there's a God? You never saw him. How do you know you have a mind? You never, you've never seen your mind. Can you imagine if, how do you know you have a brain? You could go, oh, how I, could, oh I had x-rays done. I had an MRI and they showed me the scan. I know that there's some gray matter somewhere up there. Here's part of the point. In another time, the great servant and Saint Matthew Henry wrote about these verses, quote, faith and hope go together. And the same things that are the object of our hope, that's also the object of our faith. What does he mean by that? He means that Jesus is our hope. Jesus, his life, his words, his death, his resurrection. 
Matthew Henry writes, it, faith, is a firm persuasion, an expectation that God will perform all that he's promised to us in Christ. And this persuasion is so strong that it gives the soul possession of those things. Believers in the exercise of faith are filled with joy and unspeakable and full of glory. Christ dwells in the soul by faith and the soul is filled filled with the fullness of God. How are you saved? By faith. How are you kept? By faith. How do you grow? By faith. Faith is a knowledge of what is real. Now, I'm going to go one step further. Faith is, is not simply the knowledge of what is real. It's the possessing of what is real. And then experiencing what is real. So faith incorporates trust and possession. We possess what God says in the Bible. We have confidence in what God says. We live our lives having confidence that what he says is true. And even though it sounds like a cliche then, faith sees the invisible. Faith believes the incredible. Faith receives the impossible. And so in verse 2, the reward of faith. Look what it says. For by it, that's faith. For by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. This is the reward of faith. The author makes certain that we understand about the reward of faith. What is their reward? For by it, faith, the elders obtained what? A good testimony. In what sense? Whose testimony? My testimony? Your testimony? I think that the context requires that it's God's testimony. That this is God's approval. I want you to pause and just really think about it for a moment. When God says, I love you, and you say, I believe it. When God says, I'm going to send Jesus to save you, and you go, I believe it. When you pray to receive Christ and you receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior and you experience forgiveness and you experience his grace and you forgive, experience hope, do you think that that creates God's approval or disapproval? Go ahead, you can say it. Just pretend we're a Pentecostal church just for a second. <laughs> just for a second. Just say, God... It, God approves of people who accept Christ as their savior. Go ahead and say it. God approves when I receive Christ as my savior. He doesn't disapprove. He approves of it. Now I want you to think this through. God is pleased when we not only believe in him, but when we trust him. In the book of James, chapter 2, we read that true Bible faith isn't dead. It reveals itself in love in verses 1 through 13 and works in verses 14 through 26. So faith simply isn't the historic facts about the basic ideas of Jesus, but saving faith. Saving faith is a different kind of faith. And that's why James writes and he says... That the demons, you say you believe in God, well, the devil believes in God. So what? So just simply the acknowledgement of the existence of God isn't the thing that God approves or rewards. And so you might say about your family member or friend, well, at least he or she believes in God. Our right response should be whoop de doo the devil believes in God. We thank God that our atheist friends will sometimes move into the area of agnosticism. And then from agnosticism, they're willing to concede that a real God actually exists. And, I, and I'm all for that. But the truth is, there's something more that is necessary than just simply believing in the existence of God. 
And so when he says, for by it, that's faith, the elders, who, who are the elders? The elders are the men and women who lived in times past. The elders are those people who believed in God, followed God, trusted God. The rest of the chapter is going to be devoted to those elders. You can see it for yourself. Abel is going to be mentioned. Cain is going to be mentioned. Enoch is going to be mentioned. Noah is going to be mentioned. Sarah and Abraham are going to be mentioned. And so the list is going to go through a list of these elders, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the parents of Moses, Moses, Joshua, Israel, Rahab. He's going to go on and just give a very brief mention of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. This is who he means. But he means all of the people that he's getting ready to talk about and all of the people that he doesn't have time to talk about. He's also going to be talking about those people who not only believed God and trusted God, but the people who turned away from the world. The people who decided that they were going to forsake the pleasures of this world. They were going to abandon the false promises of this world. These were the men and the women who, I, know, I don't know if you're familiar with the song. There, there's a song that, some, that, that we sing in, in the Christian community that they will abandon it all for the sake of the call. They're willing to turn from all of the phoniness and wickedness and their faith in God will please God and their faith in God will mean that they're accepted and their faith in God will mean that they are honored. Now, I want you to think that's why they're in this particular chapter. God accepts their faith and God honors them for their faith. With God's approval will also come God's reward. And so in verse 2, for when it says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Testimony is speech offered in support. In legal Parlance, it means speech that's offered in support concerning an event or concerning a person. And so when you see all of these religious movies about people saying, what's your testimony? Your testimony is the acknowledgement of what God has done in your life through Christ. So what does it mean when it's talking about, about for by it the elders obtained a good testimony? I think what it's talking about is the testimony of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, and this is the testimony. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. This is the testimony. This is as if what John is saying is, I call the God of the universe to the stand. Raise your right hand. I God, I God, swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me myself. <laughs> and what is his testimony? That God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the testimony of God. Real life, eternal life, forever life, is having a right relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't have a right relationship with God. So then... Faith is the act of believing and the faith is the truth that's believed. Do you understand that? Faith is the act of believing. The faith 
is the truth that's believed. In our culture and society, we use faith in a fairly flippant manner. What faith are you? I'm a Catholic. I'm a Protestant. I'm a Methodist. I'm a this. I'm a that. We typically make a reference to some sort of religious tradition in which we are raised. But that's not the biblical meaning of the term. The biblical meaning of the term is faith in the existence of God, faith that God speaks. It's faith that what he says is true. And so the writer will give a list of those heroes. And again, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at these heroes. And you know what all of them have in common? All of them will have their faith put to the test. And you know what else they all have in common? That their faith, once put to the test, is discovered to be real and true because in spite of pain, in spite of hardship, in spite of suffering, in spite of, of persecution, their faith is going to be found to be confident. And God will pr preserve them and deliver them. And so that's the idea. The writer will show us that not only has their faith been put to the test, but that in each and every instance of all of the people that we're talking about, from Abel to Enoch to Noah to Abraham and Sarah, what all of them had in common is that all of them will reach out and grasp something unseen and find it to be real. Do you remember when you accepted Christ as your savior? And you thought, this is crazy. This is corny. Who in the world would believe such a thing? And then you found your own heart saying, I want to believe this. This is what I want to believe. I want to believe that there's a God who made me and a God who loves me and a God who's willing to forgive me and a God who is willing to sustain me and a God who's willing to walk with me throughout all of life's problems and a God who will carry me into the future and that, again, like the song that we sing and when, I, when I'm gra gasping for my, my last breath, when my lungs refuse to operate, and my heart no longer beats and I close my eye in death that a real God is going to bring me back to life. At the close of his will, Patrick Henry stated, there's one more thing that I would like to leave to my family. Christian faith, with that they would be rich. Did I not leave them one shilling without that they would be poor had I given them the whole world. I think about that because my children are here and my grandchildren are here. And if I can leave them just one thing, if I can leave them just one thing, if there's just one thing that I can make sure that they have forever, it's the confident assurance that God is real, that God has spoken, and that everything he says is true. And so he not only talks about the reward of faith, but look, the, the, the necessity or the necessary understandings of faith. And now we see this unbelievable statement. The writer says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Now, again, I want you to understand what you just read. I want you to understand the relationship between faith and understanding. By faith, we understand. That's what the Bible says. The word understanding is very, very interesting in the original language. It's the Greek word noeo. Um, it's a word that means to perceive with your mind. 
And so here the word understand means something that you're able to grasp with your brain, with your mind, with the mechanism or the organism that God has given to you. It, it, here it means to understand in such a way that you come to the conclusion that something is true. It isn't just simply acknowledging the reality of something that's been presented to you. It means coming to the conclusion that you understand what it is to be true. And so here, when he says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. The worlds, here is another interesting word. It's aeonios. Here, the word aeonios can mean one of two things. And it may mean both things. It can refer to the physical reality that you see all around you, the physical universe, the earth that you're on, the platform of this planet as it rotates around the sun, which is in the center of our solar system, making its way through a galaxy, and that these galaxies are rotating in a universe that according to science is 14 and a half billion light years across. It could mean that. The other option is that it means ages. Aeonios was a word that could mean age to age. And so it literally means ages framed as cateradzo. That means to arrange or set in order or to adjust we might even say fine tune, it carries with it the idea is that it was framed, designed, fine tuned in order to do exactly what God intended. The idea being that God has framed or designed or arranged either the universe that the earth is going to be exactly how it's supposed to be in relationship to the sun with a moon that causes tidal reality uh, that rotates around a galaxy that rotates in a universe that will sustain you for life. In other words, it's not an accident that you're here. Contrary to the myth that you are mud that becomes mind over the course of billions of years. The Bible says exactly the opposite. And so one of two things is true. It means to arrange in order to adjust as it relates to the universe, or it means to arrange in order and adjust the duration of the times spent on the planet Earth. The age of Adam, the age of Noah, the age of Abraham, the age of Moses. As you go down the, the list and you, you look at Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, you look at Moses and Joshua, you look at Rahab and you look at the testimony, the idea that he's going to be talking about in the not too distant future, that as the unfolding of human history has taken place, God has been very specific and precise. It could mean that. It could mean the material universe. It could mean the unfolding of all of the things that he's going to talk about. It could mean both. Clearly, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And so for the person who says, that's just your assumption. You Christians always start with that first sentence in the Bible. Yeah. Because if you can believe the first sentence, every other sentence becomes easier and easier to believe. The moment that you come to the conclusion that a real God created the heavens and the, and the earth, then it's not that hard. It's not that difficult to go, oh, you mean he could do all of these other things? You mean he could prophesy about sending his son? You mean that he could order and orchestrate all of the events of the planet earth around this single event? You mean that he could cause me to come into existence? You mean, you mean I could learn to read and I could hear what the Bible says and I could believe the story of Jesus? Think about what's being said. 
God did create the universe. Not just any God, but the God of the Bible. The universe is not a self-created entity, but was created by God. The Bible teaches that God didn't fabricate the universe from pre-existing materials, but spoke the universe into existence. And you've got to understand something. When the writer of Hebrews was writing this statement that you are reading here tonight, the vast majority of people living in that culture and that society did not believe that God created the universe from nothing. They believed that God created the universe from pre pre-existing material in the universe and that explains why the universe is so messed up. That's why it's so flawed. That's why things are broken and that's why things are so terrible. The people in that day believed that this is the way God made me. And it wasn't true. God created the universe from nothing. Why is that an important part of our theology and the testimony of the Bible? Because the Bible's theology and testimony is that God created the heavens and the earth and that he created it perfect and he created it according to his will and he created the animals and everything that occupies this universe to cooperate with God. The Bible teaches that God didn't fabricate the universe from pre-existing material. The Bible says... Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of the heavens, and all their host, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. Thou preservest them all, the hosts of heaven worship you, it says in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. In Job it says, he stretches out the north over the empty place. He hangs the earth on Nothing. Remember, Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Job, the oldest book in the Bible, says God created the universe. God created the planet Earth. Well, what, what holds the Earth up? A turtle, like some African cultures believe? Or Atlas, like the Greeks believed? And the God of the Bible says... I hung the earth on nothing. Well, how does it stay afloat? Wait about 4,000 years and I'll start to give you at least some ideas of gravitation, quantum mechanics, and celestial mechanics. Well, can't you tell me now? No, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you what you need to know. In Psalm 33, 6, the psalmist says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all of the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So the Bible teaches that the universe is real, unlike Hinduism, which teaches that all of reality that you experience in this time, space, circumstance is an illusion. I remember when I was in India, and I was traveling on a train, and I asked him, I said, Tell me, do you have any spiritual beliefs? He goes, yes, I'm Hindu. Tell me what you believe about reality. Oh, reality is maya. It is an illusion. It is not really there. And I said, can you tell me then why you look both ways before you cross the street? <laughs> hey, man, you're asking me a really good question. You may theologically think that this place is not real, but the Bible says that it is real. The Bible teaches that mind precedes matter. It takes mind to conceive and design and build. The Bible teaches that the universe and this planet has its origin in the purpose of God and the plan of God. And so the Christian has four strong sources to demonstrate the origin and the purpose and the end of all things. Number one, we can observe the universe around us. 
All of modern science is based on that assumption that the world in which I'm living in, I can look at it, I can evaluate it, and it can tell me something about itself. Number two, we can read the Bible, the written revelation of God. Number three, we can hear the Lord Jesus, the living word, the living revelation of God. Number four, we can experience the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the lives of others. And so all of these things testify to the fact that God is real, that God speaks, that what God says is true. And so according to the Bible, a self-existent God created the universe. And now I want you to think this through, and I don't want to get too technical and too difficult, but I want you to think in terms of categories. There's two broad categories of reality. In one category, is a self-existent being. In other words, the way I think we could turn, we, we, could, we, we could say this is, there's two kinds of things, if you will. Things that are self-existent and things that depend on something for its existence. The Bible says that there's a self-existent God and there's only one self-existent God. There's not two or three or 30. And that this self-existent God created everything that's in this other category of all created things. So the things we see are made by God. The things we see are made by God. So when an unbeliever looks at the world, remember the unbeliever is the person who's disconnected from the God of the Bible, connect, disconnected from what he says, disconnected from, from the speech that he has made concerning himself and concerning Jesus. And so the unbeliever looks at the, the world and says, how did it get here? How did nothing become something? How did something become mind? And the Bible says, you weren't here in the beginning. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth screams, the universe screams design. The universe screams design. It looks like this earth in direct proportion to the land mass and water and the environmental structure and the distance of our moon and the distance of this planet from the sun, 93 million miles, everything looks like it was actually designed for someone to live here. Now imagine the person who goes, it's all one gigantic accident. I know it sounds crazy, but do you know how the universe came into existence? It just happened. <laughs> and you think we're the weird ones. We're the crazy ones. We understand that God exists. We understand that he creates the universe. We understand that God created human beings and he created them in, in his own likeness and in image. So an invisible God made the visible universe. That's what this is saying. And the testimony of the Bible is that God speaks. And the testimony of the Bible that what he says is true. But there's one other testimony that's given in the Bible. We're invited to believe that it's true. Everyone has faith, by the way. Everyone exercises faith. The issue isn't whether or not everyone has faith. It's what is their faith in? You see, for the people who, do, who don't have faith in the Bible and who don't have faith that there's a God and who don't have faith in what God says and who don't have faith that what he says is true, they have faith in something or someone either their own mind, their own heart, their own passions, their own feelings, but make no mistake about it. When a person asks you uh, this question, are you a person of faith? Here's again what your response should be. So are you. Do you stop at a red light? I always stop at the red light. Why? Because when it's red for me, it's green for somebody else. 
So you have faith that when it's red, you're going to stop because you have faith that when, when the green light says go, that the other person at the other end of the block will stop. Yes. Do you have faith that when you go to the Chinese restaurant, that there's not somebody in the kitchen going, ni hao ma, ni hao ma. I am going to spit in your food. Ha, 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 you will never know it. By the way, would you ever eat in a restaurant if you knew that people were in the back spitting in your food? What's the right answer? You have faith, don't you, that people aren't spitting in your food in the kitchen. I know some of you go, no, I actually do believe that they spit in my food in the kitchen, and that's why I never go out. But everyone has a belief system. Everyone has faith and everyone exercises faith. The issue is what will you trust? What is it that you believe? And historical biblical Christianity, by the way, is the only faith in this world that's based on assurance and evidence. Christianity alone is based on verifiable historical truth. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that no one has any excuse for not believing what God says. And so the Bible teaches us how we can have a relationship with God, and it involves four interconnected things. Number one, we have to recognize that we have a problem with God. Paul in the book of Romans wrote, no one has real understanding. No one is seeking God. Everyone is turned from God. All have gone wrong in Romans 3.11. So what does it mean to recognize our problem? We acknowledge that we've turned from God. We admit that we don't have the resources to decide for ourselves what is right and what we need. And so the Bible puts it this way. You were once far away from God. You were enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, it says in Colossians 1.21. And so number two, we realize that Jesus is the only solution to our problem with God. He's the only solution to the problem of sin. So when people sin, the Bible says, they earn wages. And that when you sin, this is the payment that becomes due, death. Our problem with God has earned us the death sentence, separation from God. We can't solve the problem. We can't become alive because we're already dead in trespasses and sins. We can't try harder to be good. Jesus didn't come to the earth to make bad people better. He, ma he came to the earth to make dead people alive. And that's why the Bible says in Romans 8, 11, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as he raised Christ from the dead, he'll give life to your mortal body by this same spirit living in you. Have you ever wondered, have you ever laid down in your bed? Have you ever gone to bed at night and have you ever said, I wonder if the Bible's true, and I wonder if I die. I wonder if God will really bring me back to life. The Bible says that there's a real God, and that he speaks, and that what he says is true, and you're invited to believe him. And so number three, we need to respond to Christ's offer to redeem us. Jesus is the only solution. We need to be given new life and God will give us new life when we agree with Jesus, when we agree with what he says about himself. And this is what he says about himself. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. 
In John 8, 24, Jesus says, you will die in your sin unless you believe that I am who I say I am. You will die in your sins. And then Jesus says in John 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even if they die like everyone else, they'll live again. They're given eternal life for believing in me. They'll never perish. He looked at the sisters and he says, do you believe this? Do you really, really believe this? And number four, you can rely on God to live in you and through you. You may be dead to God because of your sin, but he's ready to forgive you. In Colossians 2.14, it says, to cancel the record that contained the charges against us, he took it and destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. It's not good enough that you believe that God is real. It's not even good enough that you believe that he speaks. It's not even good enough that you believe that what he says is true. You've got to act as if it's true. And you can invite him into your life. You can have real faith. The kind of faith that the Bible talks about. You can have real hope, the kind of hope that the Bible talks about. You can have real life, the kind of life that the Bible talks about. Pray this prayer. If it truly reflects your conviction, if you really believe it, and you can begin a new life in Christ, you can say something like this. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I have a problem. I have a real problem, and I recognize the problem. I've sinned against you. I've gone my own way. I realize that Jesus, Jesus is the only solution to my problem. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive all my sins. I want to turn from my old life and I want to embrace a new life in Christ. I want to have a forever relationship with you. I respond right now to Jesus' offer to rescue me from death, to forgive my sin and give me life. And I trust Jesus as my Savior and my Redeemer. And right now I believe you. I believe that you'll transform me and I believe that you'll make me your child and I rely on you and only you to transfer me from this death to life. You said in John 11, 25 that I would receive eternal life by believing in you and that I would never perish. I believe and rely on you to transform me right now. Thank you for doing what you said you would do. Thank you for making me your forgiven child. Please live your life in me and through me. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, if you really meant it, you have every, every reason to celebrate. Because it's one thing to believe in God. It's even another thing to believe that he speaks. And another thing to believe that what he says is true. But it's an altogether different thing to live your life as if it really is true.